Good evening and welcome. It's great to be with you all and um, trust too many of you were not shaken by what happened on the East Coast. And I want to look tonight at a character in the New Testament. He's one of those characters that you have to look for him and yet you're aware he's there but he's not in your face and that's really part of what I want to talk about you'll find it in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36 now Joseph a Levite of Cyprian birth or from Cyprus who was also called Barnabas by the Apostles which translated means son of encouragement and who owned a tract of land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet Barnabas he's as I say one of the lesser known people of the New Testament and yet on the other hand he seems to pop up in more than one place the fact is he's one of the most important people in the New Testament I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but let me right say at the forefront, you would never have heard of Paul but for Barnabas. And yet, who knew that? He was there in the background when Paul was just beginning in his Christian life. And he was the one who pushed him forward and introduced him. Um, what about Mark and the Gospel of Mark? If it wasn't for Barnabas, we wouldn't have a Gospel of Mark. I say again, he's hardly known, and yet he is there in the background all the time. And I want to look at him. His real name was Joseph, uh, but they nicknamed him, and his nickname stuck. In fact, we only just know that he was Joseph by, by that one verse I just read. For the rest of the time, he goes by his nickname, which is Barnabas. Barnabas is the nickname, um, and I'll get to it in a moment. But this man, Barnabas, uh, we first meet him as a businessman that had land holdings possibly in Cyprus, he certainly came from Cyprus, and he was able to sell it and give the money to care for the new church that was emerging in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost. That means that he was a Christian. He came to know Jesus right there at Pentecost. He was one of the very first believers and if we had time to trace family trees and the rest of it, he was related in some way to the household of Jesus. He was in some way related to Mary. And, um, and so very close to Jesus and all of those disciples, many of them related to the family of Jesus. And this man, this quiet man, this retiring man that we hardly know anything about really, he had a quiet, I say it again, but you'll see what I mean in a moment, it was a ministry of encouraging everyone he came into contact with. And, and so they called him in Hebrew, Bar Neighbors. And Bar Nabus means encouragement. The son of Bar means son of, and Nabus encouragement. So he's the son of encouragement. And so with the words that he spoke, and let me say right at the outset that the words that he spoke, by that I mean everyday stuff, everyday stuff. Um, it, it was not that he would suddenly uh, confront you with a Bible in hand and start preaching at you. That would be the last thing that does not encourage anybody. But just in his normal everyday conversation, the words he spoke, uh, and what he did, well, the way he acted, 
acted around you and sometimes to you, and the way sometimes he would go out of his way, cost to himself, in order to encourage you, he had an effect. He imprinted upon the people all around him encouragement. He lifted people up. And so, put it this way, encouragement is an expression of love. Uh, I, I'll talk about it more in a moment, but, but encouragement is love coming down to where you are. When you are hurting, when you are pain-filled, when you are broken, when you're burned out, when you feel hopeless, encouragement is love coming to where you are, getting underneath your burden and lifting you up. And so when Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, then part of that love is encouragement. And it's incumbent upon you and I as believers to become adept in encouraging one another. This is vital, and especially in the days in which we live, when there is discouragement that is pouring to us from everybody's voice and the media at all times. And because of what we know of God in Jesus Christ, because we know the grace of God, our words are words of love. That is, our words do not discourage, they do not put down, they do not join in with the complaint and the misery and the hopelessness and despair of the world but they lift up. And so believers become little communion, communities of encouraged people and encouragers, encouraging one another. And from there, go into their world to just by being who they are and speaking naturally, they encourage. So what is this word encourage? I, I, I read from the New American Standard, and so it says, the, the son of encouragement. If you have an older version, it could possibly read the son of consolation. Uh, that, that's a correct translation, but it's a bit out of date in terms of what it means. Because when we say consolation, it almost presupposes that some tragedy has happened in your life, and we've come to console you. Well, it's an old English word that has almost dropped out of use, but the word console means to strengthen. That is, when you are down, when some tragedy has happened, when you've had a great loss, some persons come to console you, to strengthen you. Well, this word really means that, but a whole lot more. You don't have to have gone through a great tragedy. It means as life bears down upon you, as the heat of the day blisters upon you, you need someone to come and strengthen you, and that is to encourage. And so the word means to come alongside. That's the first thing. You, you come alongside someone else where they are, without any condemnation, without any putting guilt upon them for how they're feeling and what they are perceiving, you come alongside, but you come with a strong word of exhortation, that, that which builds the listener up and makes them strong, filling them with hope and expectancy in God. That's encouragement. Did, did you get that as, as a person who comes alongside the hurting one, comes alongside the hopeless one, and their word is a word of, of God-filled strength, and, and it's a word of exhortation, a building up word, an encouraging word, and, and it makes the person listening strong in hope. And suddenly in their darkness, it seems the sun is rising. And there rises within them expectancy of the God who is love. And so this man, Joseph, 
in his words and his actions and that can be so simple sometimes just being there for someone or, or going out of your way for someone the actions but, but with those words and his actions he infused people with strength to live the Old Testament Hebrew word for all of this you might have read it in some again of your older versions of the Bible where they literally translate the Hebrew and it says that that a person strengthened the hand of somebody well, strengthen the hand is this word in the Hebrew language and, and so that's why they nicknamed him wherever he goes he's the son of encouragement son of means that that he's become one with it that his very presence brings encouragement when he walks in the room somehow everybody's spirit is lifted when he opens his mouth it's it's never complaint and whining he doesn't have a victim mentality he just brings the life of God that that's who he is and as I say he doesn't present you with with little books and tracks and doesn't start Bible thumping you nor giving you four spiritual laws he's just talking about things that people talk about but the way he talks and the way he looks at life it lifts you up and you realize there is a God of love and he th this situation we're in is his arena and, and hope turns toward God the the touch of his hand on your shoulder is the touch of God love the smile on his face the, those eyes that seem to read your heart and love you where you are he's the son of uh, the son of encouragement he just doesn't do it uh, here and there when it, whenever someone nudges him it, it's rather it's the way the chap is he's the son of encouragement notice the word in English en courage e n n that's in in courage giving strength to your heart so he encourages he in strengthens he's a strength bringer he's a boldness imparter and so he imparts strength to those who are feeling weak those who are burned out those who are worn out those who are ready to give up those who are weary with life those who walk and faint on the way you know his his words and just being around him imparted courage to go on and not to give up this this word encourage it isn't always words sometimes to say something to people w would just upset everything Th this is just being there you know sometimes when you've been down you don't need anybody to lecture you in fact you probably know what could be said but you just don't feel like listening to it but you need someone to be there be there A and maybe not say anything uh, it's he, he was his presence was the presence of the love of God and the strength of God flowing through him even when there were no words to say out of him there flowed rivers of life but when he did speak it was the right word at the right time in the right place in the right way in the right tone of voice so that he connected the hearer to the very strength of God that was needed at that time and so the encourager is the helper of our faith Jesus spoke of this in fact it, it comes up um, quite a bit but he said in John chapter 12 49 he said I did not speak on my own initiative but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. 
that that could take an hour just to look at that but in a nutshell Jesus when he took to himself our humanity he all the words that he said he said I learned them from the father he said the father spoke them into me so that I, I, I knew what to say and also you could almost translate that what to speak it was the tone in which he said it because you know you can say the truth sometimes and destroy people uh, but but Jesus said the father teaches me he makes reference to this now this is rather wonderful because this was written ab about 700 years plus uh, before Jesus was born in the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Isaiah is given insight by the Holy Spirit into the inner life of Jesus is fascinating in Isaiah chapter 50 is one such passage and in verse 4 Isaiah speaks as if he were Jesus and, and in so doing we're taken right into this part of Jesus life he said the Lord God has given me Isaiah but he's speaking of Jesus the Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. Do you hear that? Jesus in prophecy is described as saying that his father has given to him the tongue of a disciple, the tongue of one who listens and has then something to say that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. And you go through the Gospels and see how Jesus spoke a word, like to the woman of Samaria, like to Nicodemus, he, even down to those that he was healing, the words he spoke prior to healing them, and sometimes afterward, just a word. And yet those words were sustaining words how he spoke his parables to those who were deeply hurting. I mean, they still minister to us today. They were words given by the Father into the heart of Jesus by the Holy Spirit so that he knew how to sustain the weary one with a word. And when did that happen? Jesus says here, He, my Father, awakens me morning by morning. He said, the Father wakens me. I, I wake up at the Father's inner call. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. I can't go there because if I did, we'd be there for the rest of the night. But this is what we're talking about. Jesus is the ultimate encourager. And he says that I, I do not speak out of my own initiative. I don't speak as a know-it-all. He said, I am a disciple, I am listening to my Father, and then I am enabled to say what my Father said to me, to the weary one, and I can sustain them, nourish them, build them up. The Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus is further described in Isaiah chapter 11, where it says that the Holy Spirit is to him the spirit of counsel. That is, the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches him how to encourage. Well, that same Holy Spirit joined to this man Barnabas. Barnabas joined to Jesus. Barnabas listening to the Father in listening to the Spirit who reveals in him the heart of the Trinity. Now that sounds so high and wonderful. I am sure that many of you watching right now will say, well, that's beyond me. No, it, it's a relationship with the Holy Spirit that you only truly realize after it's happened. Because I cannot emphasize enough what Barnabas was doing was natural and normal and not thought up 
and didn't have something memorized. He just talked as a normal person. He just acted out of the inner urges of the Holy Spirit. But how can I put this? The Holy Spirit is so normal, most religious people would be offended by him. Does that shock you? You see, we, we have put God stuff and the Holy Spirit into a separate category from being a normal human being. And, and, and so we live a life and then we think of God over there and, and then when something spiritual has to be done, we sort of try and make connection. Look, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever you're doing, the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is through you. And the Holy Spirit in you is the one who connects you to Jesus and to the Father. And also normal. The Holy Spirit in you does gardening. The Holy Spirit in you puts dirty dishes into the wash machine. Um, it's, the Holy Spirit is normal. And he works in you and through you at such a natural, normal level. You don't know about it till afterward. I don't know how many people tell me of words that I've said that changed their life. And uh, I, I, I don't even remember saying them for starters. And interestingly, then a good percentage of them were not when I'm preaching with notes and all that sort of stuff, but rather just in casual conversation, when I'm not even thinking of being the Word of God to people. That if you start thinking that, you mess it all up. No, the, it, it, you're, you're just being natural. And someone maybe five years later says, when you said that, that changed everything. And that's what I mean. The Holy Spirit within Barnabas was in him the gift of God to draw others out to their fullest potential in Christ. And when he passed through their life, which might be going to buy the paper at the corner store, a bottle of milk in the supermarket, a hamburger, as you pass through their life and you speak the word and you're not even aware of it and that word changes everything and when you're able to know that he used you he lets you know about it that this man Barnabas is showing us what love one another really means it means that we place a deposit of grace do you get that we deposit uh, it, it's a deposit of grace into failing, broken, hurting, fearful, sometimes despairing believers. And then he sort of fades out of the picture. And, and the person that is encouraged goes on their way. And many times they are the subject of scripture. And he shows up somewhere else. And he's doing his quiet job again of encouraging. And so this word encouragement, it means, as I said, to come alongside, to get down where the hurting person is. Or the Old Testament, Ezekiel, called it, I sat where they sat. And then with the word, with the action, sometimes with just being there, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit flows. And so this man doesn't shout. He's not an obnoxious person who goes around mugging people with the gospel. He doesn't shout. He doesn't impose himself on others and shove his way into your life to try and take control and tell you, now this is what you've got to do. You know, those awful people who manipulate you in the name of the Lord. And this man is not interested in crowds. You always find him in the scripture of seeking out the one who needs the word of life and encouragement. Or to put it this way, the encourager is a person who sees the worth and the value of a person through the eyes of Jesus. And with the compassion of Jesus in, this person reaches out to where they are. 
Do you know what I mean? The, the shepherd in parable of Luke 15, the shepherd, why did he go after the sheep? Why, why is that parable there at all, that a shepherd lost a sheep and literally risked his life in the wilderness to find it? Uh, and that was not some unusual story. Everybody listening to Jesus knew of shepherds who did that. So why do they do it? Well, bottom line, before you'd go anywhere else, the bottom line is the shepherds can see what may be you and I wouldn't see, which is the value and the worth of that sheep. And secondly, that sheep is his sheep, and it has not only personal worth and value, but it has financial worth and value. And because that shepherd doesn't see just a very stupid furry animal, he sees something that to him is of great worth and value, he goes to literally sit where the sheep sits in the wilderness and lays hold of it and is the strength of the sheep to bring it back. It's the same with the woman who looked for the coin. Why does she look for the coin? It was such a little thing, but it had tremendous value to her. And therefore, while others just saw all the dust and darkness behind the sofa and everything else, she knew that in that darkness and dirt there was something of supreme value, and that drove her to look for it. The, the father in that last parable of the prodigal son, the father does put it, this probably is the best illustration of the, those three, that the father did not see, not, not really, he did not see a, a, a haggard, a half-starved, homeless man reeking of pigs staggering along the road. He didn't see that. I mean, he did, but he saw beyond. He saw beyond the condition, beyond the behavior, beyond the words even, and he saw that this was his son. And so he looked right through the clothes and the reek, the smell, the, everything that went with this man. He looks beyond it. And he declared over him, you are my son. And actually that cost the father quite a lot. In one sense, everything to say that. Well, that's this word encouragement. To come where a person is because you see them of value. How do you look at people? That's the point. How do you see people? Do you define them by their behaviors? Or do you see beyond that here is a person who is beloved of God, a person other than you, different to you, who's done things that you feel you couldn't do, but God loves him and has expressed his love to the fullest in Jesus. And even now, though invisible to my eyes, the Holy Spirit is at work in him. And now, the Holy Spirit in you would look at this person as he looks at that person. They have value, have worth to God. And you, incidentally, you're not trying to convert anybody. You're not going to put their scalp up on your evangelical wall and say, I won so many to the Lord. You're just going to love them for who they are and be what they need you to be in this moment, the word that needs to be said. And so encouragement is a word that God takes to himself and calls himself by that name. He's called in 2 Corinthians, and it's hinted at many times elsewhere, but he's called the God of all comfort. Now the word comfort is another word that means the same thing, encouragement. And again, unfortunately, comfort today means someone's hurting badly and you come and say, they're there and you comfort them. Nothing to do with what the word really means, even in English. 
The word in English, it, 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 it's two words, come, fought, and it's Latin. And, and the word come, C-O-M, in Latin means with. And fought means strength. And that's, I mean, we have our forts, uh, especially in, in the days of early America, the, the forts. And, and um, come fought, it means with strength. And so to comfort someone is to come alongside of them and give them your strength. Well, God says he's the God of all comfort. He's the God who is with us to strengthen us. He is the one who again and again in the Old Testament especially says, Be of good courage. And David reports, It's your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Another word that is, is a translation of this idea. Jesus in Luke in chapter 1 is called the consolation of Israel. The consolation. That is not just sympathy. That's not just a there, there from God. Consolation means the strength of God infused in us to the point where he brings to pass all of his promises. And for Israel, he is speaking of the one who would resurrect out of the dry bones to life unending. And of course, the Holy Spirit is his favorite name. He's called the Comforter. That is, again, let me say, the with strengthener. <clears throat> the one who comes and becomes our strength. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Holy Spirit of work in life. Put all these words, encouragement, exhaust, consolation, comfort, consolation. Uh, it, the, the, it's a family of words that means invigoration. You're invigorated. And it leads you to a life of robust spiritual, mental, emotional, even physical health. That, that's the word. And, and a human being cannot encourage anybody apart from the Holy Spirit. I'm very aware of that. Uh, outside of the Holy Spirit, uh, I'd bore you to tears. It, it, it's the Holy Spirit that comes through our, you and me, comes through our words to each other, and they strengthen, they encourage. And the amazing thing is the God of all comfort has chosen that his encouragement does not just drop out of heaven, out of nowhere, but comes to us, comes to me, comes to you, through human channels. As humans speak their simple words, sometimes stumbling words, sometimes words they hardly know what they're saying. When their actions, simple little actions that I love in action, in your prayers where encouragement is released to the max. Did, did you hear me? He is the God of all comfort. Jesus is the consoler, the comforter, the strengthener. And the Holy Spirit's favorite name is Comfort Encourager. But that, in the wisdom of God, He has chosen to bring to you and I, through you and I, we encourage one another. And Paul speaks about this in 2 Corinthians 1. Actually, if you want to really read this, uh, read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through chapter 3. It's all about the same thing. But he said there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. And that word is, it's in what we're talking about. It's the Father of compassions. It's, it's the Father whose heart is moved in love toward us. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, this word, who comforts us in all our affliction. Okay, but listen, 
He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you get that mouthful? He, he says that, blessed be this amazing God who in his compassion this God of comfort who makes sure that we are comforted with divine comfort in all of our afflictions, but not so it's a dead end in us so that we can now say this is what God did for me, but now we've got a track record of his comforting and we pass it on. We become a way station for his comfort. We become now from him in us rivers of living water that flow into the lives of others. And we comfort with, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Um, the Amplified Version, I'm just looking at it, so that we may also be able to comfort, console, and encourage those who are in any kind of trouble or distress with the comfort, consolation, and encouragement with which we ourselves are comforted, consoled, and encouraged by God. Well, how did that happen to Paul? Remember what I said, God's comfort comes to us through each other. He said, Paul just said, he's being comforted by God. How did it come? He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he's still talking about it in chapter 7, and in verse 5 he said, when I came into Macedonia, I see I had no rest. I was afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within, the man is a mess. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. So Titus, who was Titus? Well, at this time he was just almost the, the chap who traveled with Paul to carry his bags and pray with him. He uh, was just a low-level assistant. That's amazing. Paul the Apostle describes himself as in this really spiritual, mental, emotional turmoil when he came into Macedonia and he says, God comforted me. How did he do it? He comforted the depressed. How did he do it? By the coming of Titus. He said, we met up and he said, when Titus came, he brought to me the comfort of God. And do you know how Titus did that? Because he had been comforted by you Corinthians. Do you get this? Here is Barnabas, and he stands out in this, but it's all through the New Testament. This is loving one another with the love of Jesus, just normal, natural. You meet with someone, and you share with them, instead of entering into their victim mentality, instead of joining them in their complaint, instead of joining them in their spiraling down in despair and hopelessness, you speak the truth of what you see and what you know of the love of God, which in all probability they know it too, but right now they're so overwhelmed they need that word from you. And to back that up with prayers to encourage. You could say that the encourager is the hidden lung of the body of Christ that brings the breath of life to every organ. You see, you, you don't see my lungs. But if I didn't have lungs, then I'd be dead. Because it's the lung that brings in the breath, the life, to every other organ. And so, almost secretly hidden, my lungs do their work. The encourager is the wind beneath the wings that enables others to fly. It's a great story if we had time to go into it in any detail. Uh, Barnabas being the sort of chap he was, the apostle sent him to Antioch. This is all very early, right after the days of Pentecost in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. The church is just beginning and the very first 
place where Jew and Gentile came together in Christ to form a gathering of believers and I know that doesn't mean much to us today but in those days the Jews said that this was for Jews only not Gentiles and here at Antioch they'd broken over the bounds and Gentiles came and rejoiced in Jesus and confessed in salvation and and that upset everybody except Antioch but they they didn't know how to handle it how people that have never spoken to each other who are separated from each other are now together they need someone who's got a lot of wisdom and so the apostles sent Barnabas go look after that place see what's happening there they're they're an immature bunch for sure but you you go and see what's happening and so Barnabas went to Antioch and you can read it in Acts chapter 11 and when he got there, he didn't, hear me again, he didn't see their immaturity. Because if he had seen their immaturity, he probably would have said, Lord, I'm 100% better than these people. I'm, I'm going back to Jerusalem. These people are not worth it. They're... But he didn't. In fact, there's a fantastic phrase used there. It says, he saw the grace of God. Just like the father who looked through the rags and the reek and he saw his son. So Barnabas, it comes right out here. He didn't see this motley crew in Antioch who were struggling to try and make sense of this gospel. He saw through the confusion. He saw the grace of God. And he called it forth. He fortified it and he stayed with them and taught them how to walk in Christ that's that's encouragement you say what, what do you see do you just dismiss people or do you love them with the love of God in fact prior to that uh, Barnabas was the one who introduced the newly converted Saul of Tarsus now who's going to trust Saul of Tarsus? The last time we heard of him, he was beating up Christians, throwing them in jail, stoning them to death. His only mission in life was to eradicate the name of Jesus from the face of the earth. And now we've heard this cockamamie story that he became saved on the road to Damascus. Who's going to believe that? They believed it was a new ploy. He's going to be a spy among us now. And so no one wanted Saul of Tarsus. They said, go away. And it was Barnabas who risked his own reputation to get to know Saul and then take Saul with him to Jerusalem right to the apostles and say, this man is for real and I stake my life on it. And Saul was received into the earliest church in Jerusalem because of Barnabas. And then he went back to Tarsus. And now Barnabas is in Antioch. And what does he do? He says, that man Saul, he shouldn't be off there in Tarsus. I'm going to go get him. And he went and he searched through the city of Tarsus, through the back alleys and marketplaces looking for Saul. And he found him and he said, you're coming back with me. And he took him and he became an associate minister with him there in Antioch. That, that's encouragement. Finding those that everyone else sort of keeps at arm's length, but you see through it and you see what's, what's in them. The Spirit of Christ is in them. And just a word here and a word there. And praying for them continually, you call forth that and you declare over them who they truly are. He saw the grace of God. What, do you, what does grace look like in order to see it? What do you see when you see grace? Grace. Actually, people use that term very, I don't know, they, many people don't know what they mean by it. it. It's grace is the active presence of the Holy Spirit appropriating to you and me the life of 
in Christ. That is, grace is not something separate from the Spirit, but grace is the Holy Spirit at work in you, giving you the strength and the wisdom and the courage and the ability that comes directly from Jesus to you. And He gives it to you at every level of your being, which results in our behavior change which may be very minuscule and that's why it takes a man like Barnabas to see the grace of God. I, I see what's happening here. If I was a Pharisee I wouldn't see it. I'd only see these people who are not doing it right and they're not keeping the law. And dear Lord did you see what he did there? He said what? And so on and so on. No, if you see the grace of God you'll see there's God at work here. And right now it may be, as it says uh, of Elijah in the storm, he's a, a cloud the size of a man's hand. But Elijah said that little tiny cloud the size of a man's hand has within it a deluge of rain. Get up and get out of here. That, that's seeing the grace of God. You see the smallest indications of the Holy Spirit at work in a person. Grace is the assured, that bold, resting in the gift, which is Jesus Christ, in the knowledge that we are beloved, we're accepted. You and I, adopted children, one with Abba, Daddy, the Father in Christ. And we're free from religious anxiety. And we revel in who we are in Jesus Christ. That's grace. Because any of that that I just said, if you know that, if you experience it, that's the grace of God in your life. Grace is the glorifying of Jesus till he fills our horizon. Glorifying of Jesus to us, in us. A relationship with God and all that it may just be beginning but can you see it in others you see only when I have seen the grace of God in my life can I see the grace of God in your life does this make sense it's how we have experienced his comfort, so we comfort. When we have the beginnings, the recognition that we're beginning to see the love of God, as if we're waking up and trying to open our eyes, we know we're awake, but we can't quite make it yet out of bed. You know, you're, you're awakening. Yeah. And you, you, you know, even though sometimes you waver a bit, but you know there's an assurance being born in you. You know that you're a child of God. You, you have the assurance that you are one with Jesus, that Christ lives in you. When you know the grace of God, then you can see the grace of God. And you can give the grace of God to others. And as you give them, you receive them more. You can't give it away fast enough the more it comes. You see, what we see in ourselves, we see in others. That is not always true, but it is true enough. Jesus said, who is forgiven much, loves much. When we know that we are the beloved of God, when we know we're released from our sins, guilt, when we know that we can look into the eyes of our Abba without shame, then we are very ready to see that love toward and in others. And we're ready to call it forth in them and to speak the truth to them in love. Look, look, how can I put this? Here's three persons, and they're all looking at the same tract of land. And the first person is an artist. 
And when he sees that tract of land, what does he see? He sees essentially who he is. He sees what a magnificent painting this would make. And he's already measuring in his eye how to paint this scene. And standing beside him, looking at the same tract of land, is a developer. And he doesn't even see the land. All he sees, if only we get some roads in here, we could build two or three subdivisions here, and a shopping mall over there, you see, because you, you see who you are. And standing alongside of him would be a rancher. And all he can see is what pasture land for sheep and cattle. I hope you get the point. It, it, it's a very challenging point. Um, the way you look out at life is a reflection of the way God has and is dealing with you. And so the encourager is one who comes alongside and sees with God's compassion he sees actually through the eyes of Jesus. And so the New Testament called you and I co-workers together with God. Co-workers together with God. We're co-servants with Jesus. Or as John says in his first epistle, as he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. Or again, he said, if we say that we abide in him, we ought to walk even as he walked. And so we see God's gift at work in others and we encourage them in that. We see God's strength and we, we see God's love at work and so we give hope. We see people in the process of becoming and we communicate the assurance. See, Barnabas traveled with Saul when he was still Saul of Tarsus. And they traveled together on what we call the first missionary journey. It was during that journey Saul changed his name to Paul. And it was Barnabas and Paul who traveled on their very first trip out beyond Antioch and far beyond Jerusalem to spread the message. And they carried with them um, either the nephew or the cousin. It, it could be either way in the Greek language there. But anyway, a close relative of Barnabas. It was young John Mark. Um, he was young young and the idea of a journey to the beyond with this message was very exciting but when things got a little pressured not that he was one of the speakers he the actual words there used of him he carried the cases and he, he carried the scrolls because Bibles in those days didn't fit your pocket. There were great big scrolls that you carried. And so John Mark w w carried all their luggage and certainly he carried the scrolls. Uh, th that was his job. But still he felt the pressure, the persecution was rising and they'd hardly really got started. And John Mark says, I've had enough of this. I can't take it. I'm going home. And he got the next boat back across the Mediterranean home. Not much was said, but Paul, he had resentment against John Mark for leaving them, abandoning them in the middle of the work. And when they do this long missionary journey and then they come back home to Antioch and they report to the church everything that had happened and I see John Mark way in the back there trying to hide behind the person in front of him because he had forsaken them uh, at the beginning of the trip really. Ashamed. And then Paul wakes up one morning and said, you know, I want to go and visit the brothers and see how they're doing. It's been a long time since we were there. It becomes what we call the second missionary journey. And so he calls Barnabas and he said, let's go and bless the brothers that we 
founded those churches. And so Barnabas said, and we'll take John Mark with us. And Paul's eyes flamed, and he said, over my dead body. And the words in the scripture are very strong. It, it, it's almost the words that would be used of a divorce. It would describe, you could hear them arguing down the street. And finally, Barnabas walks off. Paul takes Silas, and Paul and Silas go on their second missionary journey. And Barnabas is left behind because he will not leave John Mark. He said what he did when he left us. The Holy Spirit's been at work in him since then. He's not the same fellow, and we should take him with us. Paul said no. And so Barnabas took John Mark took him to Cyprus and there he was exposed to the work of God and the giftings of the Spirit and he grew and Peter you know Peter the Apostle he was looking for what shall I say a secretary I don't think Peter was too educated he was a fisherman and he needed someone who could do some writing for him and so Barnabas recommended John Mark. John Mark goes and joins Peter as his secretary. And whenever Peter preached, John Mark took notes and wrote it all down. And one day he put it all together and he wrote what we call the Gospel of Mark, which is really everything Peter said of being with Jesus those years. And at the end of Paul's life, when he's in prison for the gospel, he writes and he says, bring John Mark, I need him. And it all came around in the end. But do you realize you never would have heard of Mark, but for Barnabas, who could see through his leaving them, letting them down, leaving them in the lurch, that Barnabas saw through to a young boy in which God was at work and he says, I'm not leaving him. And it's strange because Paul would never have been Paul but for Barnabas and John Mark would never have been John Mark but for Barnabas. It's amazing what encouragers to do. But very few people want to be encouragers. You know, today's culture looks for one thing only. You, you, I think I've told you before that a, a wide swath of, of ten-year-olds were asked in a poll, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the universal answer was famous. See, when I was a kid it was a fireman or something like that. But today's culture famous doesn't matter famous in what just famous doesn't matter what I do to be famous I just want to be I want the whole world to know my name and to know who I am and to swoon at my presence and I go sometimes or used to go a lot to Bible schools and I would ask the students what what's their vision where where, where are they going after this and do you know great number of them said that they were to have a worldwide ministry or and many others said they wanted to pastor mega churches and all of them seemed to think that the will of God would be to have the biggest public power ministry sad really you know because you can't love mega crowds you can't love blocks of people. Only look at one person at a time and see into their heart and see that the very indelible signature of God who is love has been written in their heart and God is saying, I love this person. He's looking at them with his love through your eyes. Sad. The people have lost 
even the thought it might be the will of God that I go through life encouraging people. Instead, I, I don't really have, I've never found the will of God until I've got the biggest and the greatest and the most noticed. No, Jesus was known as the encourager. Do you remember it says, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. Even when we're broken, he still works with us because he sees our value. We're worth dying for. We're worth his blood. We're worth carrying into resurrection to the Father. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 32, and again, it's one of those we could spend ages on, but it, it says, Behold, it's speaking of Jesus, Behold, a king will reign righteously. That, that's Jesus, the king who reigns righteously. Then he goes on, and princes will rule justly. And so it depicts a time when there's not only the king, but right alongside of him, what this prophecy called princes. You do know what that's talking about, don't you? You, me. Jesus is the king, but we are joined to Jesus and Jesus to us by the Holy Spirit so that we are the princes and we are sharing in, yes, you, we are sharing in the rule of Jesus this very day. But then it goes on, okay, it's established the king and the princes. Now, and each... That is, this king and the princes, each, so we're talking about all of them now, will be like a refuge from the wind. You know what that is? When you stand behind some great rock, when there's a howling wind and you're sheltered because the wind goes by you, and the rock is taking the brunt of it. A shelter from the storm, same idea. When the storm is putting its fury upon you and you find a shelter, and the fury hits the shelter, you're... And like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land, this is describing encouragers. Those who will come to the person who's hurting, who's down, the person who needs that strengthening word. And they, with their words and their presence and their prayers, they will be a refuge from the wind. They will be a shelter from the storm. Their words will be like streams of water in a dry country. And their words and their presence and their prayers will be like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. I'd like you to pray a prayer or something like it. To pray, Lord, give me your eye. Give me the eyes of Jesus. Let me see the one who needs to know your love. That in my presence, in my words, in my actions, let your strength be imparted to all I meet. Let me be your love-saving presence to every person I meet and do business with in this world. And may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. To pray something like that, to, to pray it daily until it has become the very throb of your being. But then having prayed it, it means you put it into his hands. So I say, forget it. I am not telling you to go out there and look like God's final word on encouragement. Just go out there and believe that he hears you and the Holy Spirit in you is the encouraging word. Forget it. Be your natural self in Christ. 
and he will be his natural self in you. Amen. I trust this has been of some help to everybody here. And um, if you have any questions or sharings, let's go ahead and do it. And John is overseeing the chat tonight to make sure that what happened last week, which I didn't know happened until I got home, but um, we will make sure it doesn't happen this week. So, do we have anything that you would like to share? Yeah, Charles, I often hear the enemy say you have to believe in the love of God as if a mental struggle is required. Sometimes I believe him, I always feel I'm not acting or loving like I should, and if only I on my screen that's disappeared so I'll get back to you Charles but but let me say this um, the moment I try to analyze how I'm feeling about the love of God and whether I'm loving enough then just quit it we receive the love of God by God himself simply loving us. And the moment I try to think about it, I miss it. My only response can be praise to God. But at this moment, against what may be at that moment my common sense, against all the feelings in my being, I am God's beloved. And I then go to share that love with others and it's in the sharing of it that I am really, um, what shall I say, I, I know that I know now in, in, in the sharing of it with others. And, um, and so that, that is true. But never analyze how much you're believing because that will give you a mental disaster. Never check on your feelings to see how you're feeling the love of God. Simply accept this is the way it is. I mean, I don't go around saying, am I feeling gravity enough? Do I believe in gravity enough? No, it just is. Well, at a level a trillion times more than that, I is, I am in the love of God. And that's the way it is. Whether I feel or not, whether I believe enough, whatever that means, or not, it is. So, Alan, praise report. I'm 51. I have been unemployed for six months from a well paying Wall Street job. I searched but received not one call or email, only silence. I continued to trust against all odds that he would walk me through the valley. Vowed to live only in the present moment. That's the most important thing you've said there. Not to control or imagine the outcome. Bottom line, he supplied our family's needs renewed my spirit and led me right into a job tailor-made just for me. Imagine that. Behold our God who speaks all things into existence. He is my life and my love. Thanks to you and my brethren in this wonderful room for help. Amen and thank you Alan for sharing that. We had someone whose uh, screen name was Sincere and I, I spoke strong words to them that this would be their testimony and thank you Alan and I trust people in like situation are watching tonight um, because there's plenty of people that need to hear that and what you said there and I'm very I'm toying with the idea um, very soon to talk about it when you said you lived in the present moment let me say again no, I was going to say what I said last week. I didn't. I said it on the retreat this weekend. The mind of the flesh must have time. The mind of the flesh must have the past in order to say, if only I had, if only I hadn't, 
If only we could go back and live as it was then. And so it goes on, the old whining flesh. But it has to live in the past in order to find identity. Or it lives in the future, which usually is disaster, produces anxiety, and I'm terrified of the future. And again, find my identity in my anxiety. But the Holy Spirit lives in this present moment. And that's the mind of the Spirit right now. And so, thank you, Alan, again. That was great. Uh, Mark, uh, sounds like we are usually encouraged by other believers, but do we sometimes receive this encouragement directly from the Lord? Yes, we do, um, unquestionably. But I will pose this, that I can't prove it, except from the general tenor of Scripture, when we receive it directly from the Lord, which is when God speaks a, would you understand me if it's a rhema word, a living now word out of Scripture to us, or He rises within us and brings things to our remembrance, but it's alive, and it's peace, and we lift it up, direct encouragement. But you know, I believe in the incredible network of the real body of Christ, Someone's praying for you right at that moment. And I believe, because I believe in praying in the Spirit, um, which means you don't understand what you're praying, except you know a great burden is being released. And I believe that in the Spirit, many times we pray for people we know not who, but the Holy Spirit uses us to pray for people. Uh, we don't even know who they are, where they are, what their name, or what they need. The Holy Spirit does and prays through us. And um, I believe that when we are down in those occasions and then suddenly the Spirit encourages us, it's because someone's praying for us, even though they're not directly in front of us. But the answer to your question, Mark, yes. Okay. Um, Mark, okay, this is Mark Stephen. I cannot, you were at the retreat, right? I cannot find the words to say as I feel the gratitude. Thank you is too weak. So Malcolm and Nancy are opening their property to the gathering of believers this past Saturday. We had a wonderful time, and I believe everybody else did who was there. But thank you, Mark. Um, it was great to see the faces not only of Mark, but others of you who were there, who are probably on here tonight. And so, marvelous to see you all. And it was a great retreat. Okay. Um, to see a doctor and have surgery, is it a lack of faith in Jesus' healing? I need to be encouraged on that subject because of a health problem. No, not at all. I absolutely believe that the Lord uses doctors and uses surgeons. And um, I, I believe that there are paths to healing. As many of you know, Nancy is a retired naturopathic doctor. And when patients would come to her when she had a clinic, she would pray with them at the beginning to seek which path of healing um, the Lord was going to achieve his end and one of those possible paths would be going for surgery if that's what was needed and um, of course there another path was a direct work of healing straight from him through Nancy praying uh, or, or other paths of healing but no I, I believe all healing all healing however it comes comes from the Lord and um, it is a foolish person who refuses the doctor and surgery because they feel that they're, they're supposed to have faith. Um, no, join the two together. Bless, pray blessing over the doctor and the medications. Pray for wisdom in what they do. And at the same time, um, 
seek the Lord for healing that comes quite apart from that. And, um, but above all, no condemnation, my friend, no condemnation. Go uh, to the doctor and if necessary, surgery. And at the same time, let persons pray for you that you be healed. Because whether it comes to the doctor through a direct uh, gift of the spirit of healing, whether through chiropractor or herbs or whatever, God's pro-healing. And any doctor that's worth the name knows that he is only at best God's assistant. Uh, and um, so may the Lord himself bless you and bring healing to your mortal body and grant you wisdom in the path that you tread and grant wisdom to doctors and surgeons who minister to you. So I bless you. Amen. Lexi, I've been told when I've had problems that no one is going to help you. You have to do it alone. Also that no one is going to love you. You have to go to God. That wasn't from God. I don't know what kind of community of persons you heard that from, Lexi, but they certainly had nothing to do with what the Bible calls the body of Christ. The, look, I, I took the weekend, this last weekend, the retreat was about that text, love one another as I have loved you. And he goes on to say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And so we are not known as the disciples of Jesus by unique rituals. You know, um, John the Baptist's disciples were known because of their many days of fasting and their abstinence from the general fun of life. Um, no, Jesus said, that they will not know you are my disciples because of that. No, no. Uh, and they'll not know you're my disciples because you're a Presbyterian or a Baptist or whatever. And they'll not know you're my disciples um, because you, you wear certain kinds of clothing. And you know, some Christians believe they have to wear early salvation, um, early thrift store style, Salvation Army clothing store uh, in order to look holy. No, 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 no. The mark of a Christian has nothing to do with anything outward. The mark of a Christian is this love for one another that as, as we are presented to each other, that we encourage, we lift each other up. And um, if anyone has told you that no one's going to help you and no one's going to love you, well, I'm sorry, but they don't bear the signature that Jesus told us to look for. In fact, the scripture says that we are to bear one another's burdens. Interestingly, on that, um, the, in the epistles, there's two verses. One says, bear one another's burdens. The other one says, every man shall bear his own burden. Um, meaning that I, I, I'm not a codependent. I don't grab on to everybody and spill my life over to everybody. I'm not sharing my problems with everybody. That is, we bear our own burdens in the strength of the Holy Spirit in us. But on the other hand, the body of Christ is there. We are there for each other to bear each other's burdens when those burdens are too heavy. And the word there in the Greek describes a tomato plant that's being held up by, by the tomato cage. Gardeners will know what I'm talking about. Uh, when a vine climbs a trellis and the trellis holds the vine, it's the stake that holds something weak up. And that's the word. We're, we are staked to each other. And um, no, uh, no, Lexi. Um, we believers, we are encouragers one of another. If you are in the San Antonio area, beginning next week, September the 1st, which is Thursday, 
we are meeting at least every Thursday in September and possibly every Thursday thereafter in the northwest corner of San Antonio um, and we're not we're not starting a church we just want to meet together with believers and with this in mind a and the way both Nancy and I have put it we need the encouragement of other believers a and and so we're just coming together for that that purpose and so as I say I, I don't know what community told you that and if that's the only community you know you might have a problem finding others but the true church the true believer they're mocked by their love and therefore they're encouraging one of another Brenda Malcolm you have encouraged me for so many years without your knowing you have been Barnabas to me so many times thank you I pray that God will use me likewise. Amen and amen. Thank you, Brenda. Beth, I have had chronic nausea for three months. The doctors do not know what is wrong. I feel like the double-minded man in James because I know that God heals today, yet I don't think he can heal me. Well, it would take longer than the few minutes we have to assure you that it is will but let me say this Jesus is the will of God that's basic Beth that's basic Jesus is God in our human flesh explaining God to us in our humanness that is it's not vague ideas floating around in the ether it's God became human and with his words and his actions he said this is what the Father wants for you and he spent most of his time in the three years of public ministry healing the sick and it says that he healed all who came to him and therefore there is no question because we're dealing here with something so basic as Christians we believe that Jesus is God come and joining our humanness in order to tell us in human words and human actions exactly what God wants and he healed it goes further that after those three years of doing just about nothing but healing people physically, mentally, emotionally, he then goes to the cross, which is joining us at the very guts of our being. And at that point, the prophet said he bore, and in the Hebrew language it's very strong, he bore our sickness, he carried our diseases and our pains, this is Isaiah 53, but it's in the Hebrew um, that it comes out so strongly. I mean, any Hebrew scholar, even those that would not believe what I believe necessarily, but they do admit that's what the Hebrew says, that, that Jesus, in, in his death on the cross, bore our sickness, disease, our pain, and our hurt at every level of our mortality. And again, in that same chapter, it says, by his stripes or by the intense, unspeakable suffering of Jesus, he bore our healing, carried our disease, and by his stripes or whippings and sufferings, we are healed. And so, if we take it just with Jesus alone, um, he says that he wills to heal you. And in the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant, and remember, we're living in the better covenant, but the Old Covenant, he said in Exodus 15, I am the Lord who heals you. Or maybe a better translation there, I am your health. And the word for healing in the Hebrew language means to mend, uh, to, to stitch it together and mend it. 
And so he is the one who mends our bodies as well as our minds and emotions. And then, of course, the Acts of the Apostles is filled again with believers praying for people who were sick and they're being healed because Jesus said that the works he did, we would do also. And so, Beth, I tell you in the name, Lord Jesus Christ, that the love will of God for Beth is that you be healed. And I do not appeal to your feelings or to whatever may have been taught you in the past, but I proclaim over you the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit will make that real in your life. He wills your healing. Amen. Okay, again, Beth goes on. When Jesus healed, there was no delay. Why does God delay answering prayers? Um, I, I don't have a full answer to that, um, but we have record in the scripture um, of believers praying and not having immediate answer. And Jesus himself said, ask and you shall receive, but the word ask there, if you read it in the Amplified Version, um, which is telling you really what the Greek language says there, it says ask and ask and ask and ask. And then he gave the parables of persons who um, shamelessly, I mean that means in your face, continue to ask. And um, that is to do with us, not to do with God, is what God is doing in us. And um, I wouldn't bother your head about that, Beth. Many times questions like that one are because we haven't got settled the original question concerning the will of God. And um, so understand the will of God for you is healing and the rest falls into place um, okay and um, yeah okay we're coming to an end here but um, I'm beginning to understand that God answers my prayers as I voice my need and continue on my way and it amazes me how God will drop the answer right into my lap and he does it as I continue my day. Amen. Well said. Okay, Jeffrey, can we effectively encourage others by telling them what God has shown us um, in the midst of our challenges in life? Does the Holy Spirit set us up to help others based on what we have learned? Many times. Um, and I, I think we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Um, that is, we do share our very life with the Holy Spirit and therefore He urges us from the inside and, and we must follow that. But um, as a general answer, that's what I said from Corinthians, that um, the Corinthians encouraged Titus, Titus encouraged Paul. And so we, our encouragement is in order that we might have a track record of encouragement and out of our encouragement we encourage others even if we don't exactly tell them how we were encouraged it's just from our encouragement but general answer Jeffrey yes uh, Mary I try to stay away from Christians who I find to be the most unencouraging people on the planet Amen to that. Amen to that. I, I do not want to be around people that uh, will leave me drained, leave me feeling that uh, I have been discouraged. Um, now the whole, everything about, well, the, everything about the gospel, Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us equals Love, encouragement, uplifting. Um, okay. Well, um, 
I just do this one, Bob. Several years ago, I would have laughed at you that one could, and I lost you there, yeah, here we are, uh, could experience peace. I can't explain. In the face of this present economy, I feel such peace. It's not like the old Bob. Amen and amen. That's a good place to finish. It is not like the old Bob or the old any of us. We are new creations in Christ. Okay. Um, next Tuesday night. And again, let me say that if you live in the San Antonio area, every Thursday night we'll be gathering in the northwest of San Antonio. And uh, details of that can be found on our website. But it will be a time of praise and worship. I'll do some teaching. We're not recording it because I want it to be just believers coming together. And I don't want to be following the series or I have to do an hour or whatever. I just want to fellowship with my brothers and sisters and then to pray with people who need it and to generally be the body of Christ. And so if you know anybody in San Antonio that uh, you feel would be open to that, you can let them know too. But otherwise, I'll see you next Tuesday night. And now the blessing of God, almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you, fill you with his love, fill you with his encouragement, and out of your then innermost being flow to others with words of life and actions of love. So I bless you. So I bless your extended family this night, this week, and to the ages of ages. Amen. And amen.